So thank you all for coming this afternoon to this presentation. I know security isn't a really sexy topic. Um, we saw a lot in the keynote this morning that got me really excited. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we don't protect our data, then a lot of people get hurt. Uh, maybe not directly, but certainly indirectly. And a few years ago, I was doing a presentation to some auditors, um, and they asked me a question about how an attacker would go after SQL Server, specifically. And that was the genesis of this presentation. So before we get into the presentation, the obligatory uh, information slides, please uh, silence your cell phones if you can. And, and then obviously, if you weren't in Kevin's awesome talk that was just before this, there's a lot of stuff out there. Definitely visit the past.org website. And the community has so much to offer. And if you're new, this is your first time, you've gotten exposure to pass, let me encourage you to just go out and, and hit us on Twitter, go to the virtual chapters, find a local chapter. There's just so much out there uh, to help you grow your career, to help you increase your knowledge, and, and to give you folks that are in the same boat as you, folks that may be a little bit ahead of you, folks that are bona fide experts uh, to help you along with any problems that you have, and also to kind of give you an idea of what's to come and what's hot, and what's interesting, and what's not. Uh, because as, as our topics change over the years, uh, as, as our technologies change, obviously some technologies fade out. For instance, some of you probably have never heard of the term SQL Server Notification Services, but some of you have, right? Um, I'm Brian Kelly. If you look for me online, uh, you'll find me as K. Brian Kelly, and that's only because when I first did a search for Brian Kelly when I was... Uh, starting out speaking and presenting, I found that Brian Kelly was always taken because it's a good set of Irish names. And, and the number one hit was a sensei for a karate studio. So hence, K. Brian Kelly. With regards to my background, I'm the guy who doesn't know what he wants to be when he grows up, and I'm 45 years old. So I keep bouncing around, mainly between two areas nowadays, server-side, AD, InfoSec, and SQL Server. And so as a result, in my current job, I, even though I was retitled a data architect, my current work is mainly on the infrastructure and security side still. And that's where this came from. Because in addition to that, once you go on the InfoSec side, at some point, you'll be given the opportunity to become what's called a red teamer. Anyone been on a red team before? All right. So red teaming is when you get paid to go break your own stuff. And it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun because you finally get to unleash everything that you're allowed to within a certain set of parameters, and someone else has to go fix it most of the time. Uh, but on that same token, I was also an incident handler. So being part of a red team, you start to think about how an attacker goes after your own systems. And what you often find is that on the other side is the blue team. That's the, those are the folks that are usually responsible for trying to protect and detect. When you're a blue teamer, you get caught up in a paradigm of, hey, I know my product is good at security this way, so I'm going to leverage it to the max. SQL Server is great about that. SQL Server is awesome about that. But the problem is that if you're only thinking about what your product or your system does well, then you're going to miss what the attacker's thinking about, which is where your overall system is weak. Because as an adversary, all I care about is getting in. I don't have some kind of ego trip breaking your invulnerable system. I have a set of objectives and goals, whether I'm a red teamer and I'm doing it ethically, or we're talking about an adversary who's looking at it because they're a nation state actor or because they're organized crime and they want to make money, right? They don't have an ego trip to, to boost. Their ego trip is when they break your system and you didn't anticipate that breach. So, as always, with every session, please provide your evaluations, especially comments for improvement. As a speaker who's done it for a while, I know that there's a lot I can always improve on. And so when you offer honest feedback, it helps every speaker get better. And that's ultimately what we're here to do as professionals, is get better, whether we're sitting listening or we're speaking up here. This is the second of a pathway for security. Some of you I know talking had already attended Kenneth's talk this morning. Uh, Ed's talk is, the next one is tomorrow, and then he has a follow-on talk on Friday. 
You'll see me reference the Friday talk a little later in the slide deck uh, because it's a direct follow-on to an example that I'm going to show, and I'm only going to show it very briefly because I knew Ed's talk was coming. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, first, we're going to talk about the weakest link. And, and I don't mean that, that television uh, show where you had the lady scream out, you are the weakest link, goodbye. Uh, although what she targeted and what attackers often target is the same thing, which is people. We're going to talk about other places that if I'm an attacker, I'm going to go look at first before I ever consider going after SQL Server. And maybe I don't have those places that I can hit, but where else can I get into and from there spread? In the security world, we call that lateral movement. Some people call it spider webbing, but it's the idea if I breach one system, what can I learn from that system to move to another system, which possibly has the credentials I care about or possibly has the data that I, that I really want. And then we're going to talk about non-production because this is the weak link in most organizations other than people. And finally, I will briefly cover launching exploits, but the reality is, is that an ad, as, a, as someone who thinks like an attacker, most of the time trying to launch a direct exploit is fruitless because most companies nowadays try to keep stuff patched. They're not having default configurations. I'm looking for something else, usually a security permission set or something like that. Now, notice that when the title of the session is how I would attack SQL Server, but you didn't hear me say anything there about attacking SQL Server, did you? Well, that's because SQL Server in general is pretty secure. Um, the number of vulnerabilities is very low. The slide that popped up today at the keynote showed it had so very few vulnerabilities compared to all the other systems. And the reality is, is of the majority of those, those were vulnerabilities with DLLs that were actually at the operating system level, uh, use of images or something like that, that SQL Server also happened to reuse and therefore was vulnerable as a result. There was uh, some talk in the community a few weeks ago about a new uh, malware that was out there that allowed someone to basically have a golden password to come in. Basically, it's just simply mapping the calls that a particular DLL that SQL Server uses, mapping those calls in memory to go use its own set of calls. Here's the catch. The server already had to be compromised to, dis to de deploy the exploit. So they weren't going after SQL Server directly. They were just maintaining access to SQL Server by taking advantage of the operating system that they had already beaten. So it's not a SQL Server vulnerability. It's a compromise of the OS that leads to an attacker being able to maintain his ability or her ability to access the system. So the weakest link, well, that's us. Because we are trained in society to be very trusting, especially of people like coworkers. And coworkers send emails. And coworkers call, and we want to help them. But not just coworkers, but people in general. We're trained as a society to be helpful towards one another. And that's important because that's how society works, right? The problem is, is an adversary knows that. And in the IT world, they'll go attack it. This is something that preceded IT. We have the phrase con men who also attack that idea of trust. So how do they go after us? Well, usually by email. This is the starting point for a lot of attacks. Phishing emails. If you're not familiar with that, that's where I send something to you hoping you click on a link or do something like that. And it installs malware, maybe remote access Trojan on your workstation or some sort of backdoor so I can, can, so I can gain access, right? If we talk about phishing emails, we have this new term that came out about five or so years ago called spear phishing. Well, phishing is great. Spear phishing is even better because what's spear phishing? Oh, that's the ability to target an individual based on information that you know. If you've ever seen an email like from a CFO saying, hey, CEO, I need you to authorize this wire transfer, and everything looks right on the email, right down to the signature block, that's a spear phishing email because they're targeting the CEO because they know who he is or she is, and it's being legitimately looking like it came from the CFO. Perfect attack. And I have seen cases where unless you looked at the mail headers, you did not know it wasn't the real thing. What about passwords? 
How many of you have a help desk that can actually verify who you are when you call in without asking you a bunch of security questions that are probably available by social media? I see one hand. Now, in one case, I heard a company do something rather interesting. If you called in saying you needed a password reset, they called your boss. And your boss called you and verified it was you who was asking for the password reset and then contacted the customer support, and only then did they proceed with the password reset. Guess what? That company also experienced a decrease in the number of password resets required. <laughs> I don't know why, but most companies work with a password system, and I've seen several of them because I went through a, a source selection a few years ago, and they all work on the same idea, security questions. And almost all the security questions, if you've got a Facebook account, Twitter, whatever, most security questions, the answers are there, especially if you are the type that answer those quizzes. Yeah. Uh, and also there's the sticky note. This is still persistent. Uh, anyone remember that, f uh, that false nuclear launch alert that, that happened in Hawaii? Someone zoomed in on one of the bulletin boards, and what did they see? A little note with the password, right? We still have this problem because we still have passwords that recycle. That's a topic for a different day. Go find the NIST standard. It will recommend that you get rid of password expiration. Because when there is password rotation, people tend to choose weaker passwords. The recommendation from NIST, as of about two years ago, is now only do password, re password uh, switch over when you have evidence of a compromise. Because people know if they can keep the same password, they'll go through more effort to choose a harder password. Because they don't have to change it in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, 365 days, whatever it is. Just something to think about. So spear phishing. So you as a professional could be targeted. Why? Well, <laughs> we put all this great information in LinkedIn. So you know we can maintain contacts, possibly get a job, and everything else. Well, adversaries have the ability to use LinkedIn too. Here's a great example. I can do a search for a Microsoft DB at Wiley Coyote Enterprises. Right? Maybe, maybe, maybe the, the old coyote has something that I want uh, when he's not too busy trying to go after the Roadrunner. It's, it's very easy to do this against any company with any kind of particular job title, right? And so this, now they know who to go after. And if they know that, then they can target it. So what do they usually do? Well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get access to user credentials. Uh, almost every single example of an exploit where we look at data breaches, if it wasn't a fault of the software or it wasn't a fault of um, a misconfiguration somewhere, Usually it's credentials that get compromised in one way or another. Phishing and spear phishing make it really easy because typically, especially with spear phishing, you're targeting an individual you know who has access to the data. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a DBA. For instance, if I hit the comptroller of an organization as a red teamer with a spear phishing email and I get that person's workstation, what have I gotten? All the GL. Anything interesting in GL? A lot is interesting in GL, isn't it? Right, And so it doesn't have to be someone who is highly privileged from a security perspective when we think about, oh, this is a DBA or a system administrator or something like that. It just has to be someone who is highly privileged with respect to the data. And then if I get that, then I'm going to start doing recon. I'm going to start looking around. I want to find where the databases are. Let's talk about that comptroller. Where might I find where the database connections are? How about the Excel spreadsheet that they have that's linked to the SQL server, right? Pretty easy place. Maybe there's a, a fat client type app that uses DSN still. Uh, there's all kinds of ways. Maybe I hit the mother load and I grab the DBA. Okay, great. Now I just fire up Management Studio remotely, and now I know what all the key databases are because they're in registered servers, for instance, right? Plenty of ways to get that information. And then I'm going to execute the rest of the attack strategy. And... Hopefully, if I'm a bad guy, profit. Rest of the attack strategy, what's well, this, right? First is recon, and then scan for vulnerabilities access. Three is gain access. Phishing helps us because we enter in at three. Phishing and spear phishing, we, have, we, we basically avoid one and two. One and two is heavy lifting. That's where I'm trying to check out your systems to see if there's a weakness or a hole I can punch through. But if that 
Weakness of that hole is the person who clicks on the link that they shouldn't click on or, or opens up the attachment that they shouldn't run, then I'm already there, right? And from there, if that person doesn't have the right privileges, then I will see if I can escalate privileges. And we'll talk about that briefly a little bit later. But basically, I'm going to get to the privileges that I need to get to, get the access that I need, get the data that I need, and if I think that it warrants me coming back for more, I'll find ways to maintain access. And in most cases, in both, in both situations, I'll try to cover my tracks. This is a typical way that we do things. That vulnerability, that malware that came out, that you had to compromise the OS, it hits number five and number six. Golden password is number five. They also hit it to where if you went in and you used that golden password, your activity did not show up in SQL Server. Yeah, that's number seven, right? That's the way attackers think. So what can you do about it? These are things you've all heard before. First is principle of least privilege. If a person shouldn't have the access, you don't want to give it to them because if any user in the enterprise could be compromised, for instance, or any user in your organization has access to data, even if they shouldn't, I just got to get one person. I don't have to get that special person, in which case I can rely on a standard phishing attack, spam your entire organization, and hopefully get those emails through before the spam engines figure it out and start doing the, the, the denial of those messages. Proper auditing is important, and, and I'll give you an example why. So this goes back a few years, but Anthem Healthcare, the DBA in question was looking through the SQL servers. DBA is not named, so we don't know who it was. But that's how they discovered the breach, because the DBA realized that someone was running queries, and that someone was the DBA, except what's the catch? It was the DBA. And that's how the DBA realized his account or her account was compromised. If you have proper auditing, maybe you don't catch it when it happens, but at least you know where they went afterwards, right? And we do a lot of that with regards to security. We may, we, what we'll do is we'll, we'll correlate all the events to see what the impact was, what the spread was, what the attack pattern was going across time. You know, eventually, we'll figure out where the entry point is, hopefully, if we have enough logs, if we have enough records. But that also gives us an idea of just how many people we may need to notify which is why when you hear organizations say, hey, I've got, you know, they, they, they give some small, they get some subset of the total number, it's usually because they've traced back the logs, which is important. Because it's costly to have to notify and offer uh, identity protection and do all of those things. So the more that you can factor down and say, yes, I know it was definitely this group and maybe this group and not the whole shebang, the better off you get. Security awareness. Now, it's fairly simple, right? You test the users, you test them again, and then you keep repeating those steps. In some cases, you have to go pretty drastically. I happen to be a moderator for one of the ISACA, which is the professional organization for auditors and security professionals. And what they indicate is that the only way they get people to stop, one of the organizations, the way they found to keep people from clicking on phishing links is after the third time, your email gets disabled. Hmm. Email gets disabled, you re-go to a class. and Because what they found was is that when they just send a notification to the boss, well, that wasn't always successful because sometimes the boss was also guilty, right? It happens. I got busy. I got too many things to do. I'm not vetting all the emails. Click the link. Oh, by the way, yes, indeed, this was one of those test penetrations. You just got busted. I know you clicked the link. Please go talk to your boss or do whatever. And what they found is that when they actually disabled the email, until they went through all the training, then people started paying attention because they weren't able to work, and if they weren't able to work, then consequences happened. Pretty simple stuff, but it doesn't completely protect us. So in case anyone's not familiar with the principle of least privilege, if you go out and you look at the, the definitions online, they're really complex. They don't have to be. It's really this right here, right? You only give what's needed. If you give too little, they can't do the job, and that's a problem in and of itself. If you give too much and that account gets compromised, then they get access to stuff that they shouldn't have access to, right? Let me focus on that too little side for just a second. As a security professional, there's a, something called a CIA triad, and I don't mean the organization that belongs to the federal government. It basically stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. 
security professionals, I'm guilty of this too, like to focus on confidentiality and integrity. And we like to harden and tighten systems down to where availability is affected. But the problem is availability is a key part of InfoSec. It's basically saying that the, that the asset is available for use when it's needed to be used by the appropriate users. So if we tighten it down too much, that's a problem, right? So that's the whole thing about tightening it down too much. You can't do that. And if it does mean that you have a third-party app that has permissions wide open and your company has accepted the risk, then sometimes you just have to swallow that, that, that thickness that's in your throat and go on about it because that is the organization's choice. Auditing. We have a lot of tools available as, with regards to the Windows operating system and SQL Server specifically. SQL Server, let's focus on that because we are at a SQL Server data conference, right? The audit object, great. Brand new as of SQL Server 2008 R2, uh, which is now out of support. So if you're not using audit object, it's based on extended events, and extended events is actually what drives all that, right? Definitely, unless you're still supporting SQL Server 2008, 2000 R2, you should be using extended events and audit object. A server trace is still available, but remember, it's deprecated, and it doesn't cover any new features. And anytime they open up a new feature or add a new feature in SQL Server, like a bunch of new features that got added to SQL Server 2019, you can't go to profile or create your server trace and be able to track it, except maybe if there's a TSQL command or something you can follow. It also is more intensive for a lot of reasons with regards to performance uh, impact. So definitely don't use server trace. And there are plenty of third-party product tools. I was having a conversation at lunch with a gentleman and, and, and basically going over some of the third-party tools that augment what you can do in SQL Server. And that's always something to consider because building your own tools is a lot of times, and especially in this space, more expensive overall than buying the right tool off the shelf and implementing it. It really depends on your needs, right? But let's talk about extended events, okay? Now, if you're not very familiar with extended events, they have a lot of packages that we can see, right? So there's one here, SQL Server. And Sec Audit is actually a protected one, but SQL Server is a good one. There's a lot in there. For instance, I can see when I look at SQL Server, a lot of events. And let's just go down to where I start seeing, say, database. Like database created, database dropped. Pretty simple stuff, right? There's also ones for object. So if I and notice I have object created, object deleted, object altered. So great if we're looking at schema changes and stuff like that. We can also use it to interrogate and record TSQL statements. So let's move on from the metadata. And let's look at that. So there's a great GUI, and you can set all this up here. I'm going to create one that basically detects what happens with the databases, right? And then I'm going to create one. Uh, one thing, when you create them, you do have to start them. And then I'm going to create one that detects object change. And I'm going to start it. And then I'm going to detect one that detects simple data queries as well and start it. So three different things I'm looking at. This demo I'm going through really fast because, like I said, Ed has a, a, a complete talk on using the audit object to do similar things. Now that I've got those started, let's go over here to be able to read. So I'm going to first try, and I'm, I'm going to just see if I have any database events. I don't, which is what we expect. So let's go cause a database event to happen. Well, let's create a database, and then we'll use it. I should be auditing on create, right? So if I rerun that same query, this time 
I see who created it, when they created it, and what command they ran. Pretty simple. Extended events are much more powerful than this. But like I said, it's more than just database events, right? I can go over here and I can create tables, create procedures, drop a table, alter a table, alter a procedure, create a view, a bunch of different object interactions, and then go here and do the same sort of thing. Now, I'm not spending a lot of time going through what each step does because if you go out there and you look in the SQL community, use Google or Bing, whatever your favorite engine is, and you do searches for extended events, you're going to find that these examples are very basic, right? There are tons of scripts, tons of examples, tons of articles that cover these same things. Matter of fact, there are people who do whole pre-cons just on extended events. So that's why I'm not spending a lot of time because I'm just trying to demonstrate what we have. Now, one thing I will point out is that notice that there's two occurrences of everything. That's basically the initial statement and then basically the commit, right? So I see the drop database, the drop table, the create, so on and so forth. And let's go back and let's see about TSQL. So I'm going to do some inserts. I'm going to do some updates. And you know what? I'm going to do some selects, and I'm also going to go ahead and uh, do some permission changes because that's something we want to detect on, isn't it? Especially if we're looking at an adversary who's trying to maybe maintain access. Pretty simple stuff. And then make sure that happens. And then I'm just going to first detect the changes. And notice I'm looking for insert, update, and delete on something called foo. And there are indeed all the data changes that I made, right? So if you want to trace what happened, extended events can tell you. Remember I said we want to audit and be able to build that, that log of what actually occurred. The other thing is, is that if you know that data changes shouldn't be happening, this is something you could definitely be alerted on too. That's pretty key because as an adversary, we've, le we've learned over time that once upon a time, attackers would try to hit at 3 o'clock in the morning or some odd time for enterprises. Why would they do that? Because people tended to be less <coughs> careful. I mean, you didn't have someone on call watching, so on and so forth. But then we started building alerts looking for odd activity at odd times. So now guess what they do? They do their activity in the middle of the business day when people are really busy hoping that they blend in with the rest of the crowd, right? But they don't know your system the way you know your system unless they're an insider threat, and that's a whole different story. In which case, if they do something that you know shouldn't happen and you've got alerts looking for it, that might be your canary that says, I got a problem. I got someone in my environment, right? So... Select statements. They are, they are. Now, you saw the creates get created because I'm doing a wildcard search for select, right? But obviously, you can tailor this. That's just TSQL. That's nothing fancy. This is a simple example to show that it's possible. Remember I mentioned about permissions? Well, remember, those are TSQL statements, too. I'm just going to drop all the filters. It would help if I can do this. And there we go. There's the grant and the revoke, right? Pretty simple stuff. Nothing fancy. But... And then my cleanup. Just something built in a SQL server gets us immediate results. Existed events can run at startup if you set them up that way. Pretty straightforward. Very key on auditing. But auditing is not the only answer. Because one of the problems is that we collect so much data now that we get in the habit of just ignoring it. Right? We call this selective neglect. Almost all of us are so busy that we've got more things to do than we have hours to do it even if we're willing to completely disrupt our work-life balance, we could still find stuff to do at work, right? But with regards to auditing events, 
if you want to try to detect an adversary in your environment, that means that you have to be looking at those events as they happen. And the only way that you're going to see the spread is if you have those events and actively review them afterwards. And I say that because as an auditor, I've come into organizations and they have a control and they collect reams and reams of audit data. And then I ask a very simple question, which is, when was the last time it was reviewed? And the room goes silent. And I'm like, so how do you know? I'm like, well, how do I know what? How do you know that you had an adversary in the environment? Well, see, we have all this audit data, but no one's looking at it. That's the problem. Now, there are tools out there, uh, security incident event management tools, SIM tools, there's log rhythms, there's Splunk, there's all these others are out there. Some are open source and free, some are commercial and will charge you an arm and a leg. Find the right one for your organization. The advantage of using these tools is, is that if you can train the tool to look at the data, and remember, extended events can be dumped as XML, and you can train a tool to read XML, right? Then you can have it start to alert. That's really key. You can have it start doing correlation, which means a human doesn't have to. And you'll get plenty of false positives, don't get me wrong, but at least then you're getting some information. And then if you get false positives, you can start doing some tuning to figure out what it's stopping and alerting on. And maybe it's something that you can tweak, right? But then you get your information that you need. And the other thing is that you want to understand typical behavior. So if you've done any work with, say, next generation firewalls or load balancing devices like the F5 Big IPs, almost all of them now have these application modules that sit there and they watch normal traffic and they learn. We call it machine learning or AI or whatever you want to call it. But what they do is they come to understand what is normal and they lock that in. And then when they see something that's not normal, guess what? It stands out like a sore thumb. Your SIM devices can be trained the same way. And this is oftentimes when you go and you start troubleshooting or learning how to troubleshoot, the recommendation is you spend plenty of time looking at the real thing. And I know there's that idea of looking at the bills and everything else. That's actually a false story. But I can tell you that by looking at packet traces and stuff like that, I oftentimes find the problem without having to go to code. And I'll give you a great example. My organization, I was looking at HTTP response headers coming back from a server. And I was noting, noting that the MIME type was always 20 characters or less, right? It was a simple application. You could upload a document, and it gets stored in the database, which means it also has to store the MIME type, 20 characters or less, hmm. always, even if the MIME type should be like 60 characters because of all the open XML, whatever, with the new Microsoft versions of Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. What could possibly be the problem? Care 20. That was, that was the field. It was just that simple. How did we see it? We saw it in the response header, right? And we knew what to look for because we trained ourselves to look what was, what was normal and that wasn't normal. And that showed up like a, a, a red, like, like a big, big sore thumb. So you want to train your systems to know what's normal and then alert when normal is violated. And it could be that there's a new normal. You know, especially in an agile world, you could have a, a new feature go in and something changes. Now, hopefully, you're training these systems in non-production so you don't shut something down in production. But it's that same idea, right? You want to know more about auditing? Go see my friend. He'll tell you all you need to know about SQL Audit on Friday, and it's part of the pathway for security. All right. So we've talked about what you can do. Let's talk about what an adversary is going to go after rather than SQL Server. And that right there as a title should make it fairly clear that I'm not going after SQL Server. I'm going after where the data may be elsewhere. So remember the motivation if I'm an attacker. I don't care about having an ego contest with you and saying I breached your SQL Server. What I care about is whether or not I got access to the data or not. Right, Because the data is what's valuable to me. I can sell that. I can't sell hurting someone's feelings. And let's be honest, I don't want to get caught. Because if I get caught and I'm in the wrong location in the world where extradition does happen, then that means a pretty lengthy prison term. Because some of the cyber crime prison terms are up there with like murder. And so I'm going to ask the question, where else could you stash the data? 
where else might I, I, I be able to get to it that you might not have secured as well? Because I only care about the data. I don't care about your SQL server. You can have your SQL server. It's running great. Outstanding. We'll get to that. Right? So if I'm in it to steal it, I'm going to look other places, like extract files. I mean, I can't tell you as an auditor how many times I've come in and they have a mainframe extract or some other system extracting to text because that was the way they were CSV. And they say, oh, yeah, this system is utterly secure. We've got it so hard, da, da, da. And SQL Server, man, we, we audit it. We know exactly. It goes into our, our external auditors. Well, before you came in, always asked us for who has permissions. We know who has read, write, down to mapping them back into AD for the user directly. Great. You said that you're transferring data between these two systems. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Well, it's in this share. Oh, let's look at the permission of the share. Hey, everyone has full control. <laughs> Um, everyone, that's any authenticated user. That means if you've got the janitor to have a login so that they can do time entry, I just got to convince the janitor to click on the wrong email. Well, that's going to be fairly easy because the janitor is probably one of those people you didn't send a security awareness training. Bonus for me, right? Spreadsheets. Maybe I don't have to go into your database because if your comptroller has all the key information on a spreadsheet that your comptroller is doing analysis on, well, where do I, wh why do I need to go any further? I don't and I'm not going to. I'm going to stop right there, get that information out and go further. Uh, PDFs. Because we have this idea in business that PDFs means that you can't extract data out of them. <laughs> yeah, how many of you have used Excel's feature where you can like Get the tables out of a PDF document? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. PDFs mean nothing to me. They're just any other file source for data. I can use them. And then, of course, what if I can get your database backups and you don't have them encrypted? True story. Myself, my wife, and every single member of my immediate family has all of their identity completely compromised. And so did everybody else who was a taxpayer in the state of South Carolina about seven or eight years ago. Why? Because South Carolina Department of Revenue got hacked. And when you read the reports from the, from the folks that they brought in to do the investigation, they grabbed the database backups because this is what South Carolina Department of Revenue did. They took backups, put them on a local file server, and then they started to encrypt them. Right? Well, here's the thing. Them choosing to encrypt after they wrote the backups means at the time they were actually ahead of what the IRS required. Because if it was a local server, IRS did not require encryption on the backups. So they were actually fully in compliance with the IRS. The adversaries grabbed the backups, exfilled them using some email web-based application that allowed multiple gigabit or gigabyte attachments. I wonder which one that was. Um, and just mailed them off. And Secret Service found them and notified South Carolina Department of Revenue that happened, right? Backups are, are great. So you're upgrading to 2019 and turning on TDE because you can do that in standard edition now, right? Hopefully, right? Because that was the main complaint we had in the security side was you only have TDE in enterprise, but 2019 standard has TDE now, right? I, I, believe it, I believe that's the case. Yeah. So now we have no excuse on sensitive databases not turning on TDE if we upgrade to 2019, and that's a compelling reason to do so. And I don't work for Microsoft, that's just me talking to the security guy. Why is that important? Because if the database is encrypted, if you take native backups out of SQL Server, those backups are also automatically encrypted. That's key, meaning data at rest is encrypted. If someone just exfills the database backups, they're useless, unless you did something like put the certificate that's encrypting the database on the same directory. Please don't do that. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that in an organization. Oh, yeah, for disaster recovery purposes, we have the certificates along with... Wait, what? Wait, you have certificates with the backups? Why? Well, see, I was like, do you not realize that now I have everything I need as an adversary? Just copy that file, set of files off, and I can get access to your data, decrypt it. Whether you use TDE or you use built-in encryption and you have a certificate starting your encryption chain, no, please, please don't do that. What about sabotage? Yes, that's the Beastie Boys uh, album cover, for those of you that are old enough to remember it. And I'm dating myself. I already told you I'm in my 40s. So um, maybe I'm not into it to, uh, 
to steal your data. Maybe I'm a competitor, right? So the question then that I, I ask, and I asked this one time at a, at a Charlotte BI group with a bunch of SQL Server VPs focusing on SSIS and, and business intelligence and ETL, sitting right there in the front row, and I asked these questions, how do you know? And they were like, uh, we never check for that. I'm like, no, no, you probably don't because you're thinking like a blue teamer, not a red teamer. Red teamer, I'm going to think about this, right? Who has the ability to modify the files? Who has the ability to read the files? We, we talked about that. Who has, you know, what processes can touch the files? Ooh, mm, see, I'm going to date myself even more. How many of you remember Superman 2? You already know where I'm going. Richard Pryor's character. Oh, half pennies. What happens? No one knows what happens. Oh, I'm going to cut myself a check for all the half pennies. I'm going to get rich. What did he do? He was a trusted mainframe system programmer. That's what he was. And he wrote, rewrote the process because he was trusted to rewrite the process. That's exactly what he did. Can you detect that there's fire sampling? Yes, sir. Was it Superman 3? Yeah. It was the one with the three. Uh, yeah. 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 So... <clears throat> You know, it's one of those things where he's, it's a trusted process, so no one audits it, right? Can you detect the file tampering? Because that was the question I asked. If your SSIS packages are modified, can you detect it? And they're like, oh, yeah, sure, because SQL Server did it. I said, oh, SQL Server, it's in the database, right? Yeah, uh, what's to stop me from modifying the contents of that database? Silence. Andy Leonard was there for, that re for whatever reason there, too. And you can ask him. He's just like, oh. Because <laughs> I'd asked him the question about two weeks earlier, and he was just like, Brian, why do you make my head hurt? I was like, because this is the way attackers think. All right, maybe I can't get access to the data right away. Maybe I get access to a system and it doesn't have the permissions, the account doesn't, whatever else. Well, what else can I do? Well, lateral movement is where I compromise the first resource. Maybe it is the secretary's computer. I'm going to look for other ways to keep moving. You know, Windows platforms have to be patched. The question is, is what account is using to patch them? There's, you know, maybe a workstation admin logs in with their privileged credentials to figure out why that, uh, that workstation has a problem, such as not updating GPOs. Common problem with Windows workstations. It happens every once in a while. You've got to do it. Maybe, maybe as a DBA, you logged on to uh, a server, right? Uh, and because that's where the file share was for the extract. And now if you're caching password hashes, uh, maybe I can grab it which if you're using task schedule, you kind of have to. That's the only way that works. Uh, I'm going to look what I can find, credentials, configuration information, whatever it is, and then I'm going to see what other assets I can hit. I'm going to keep spreading until I get what I want. And if you ever bring in a team to pen test your organization, this is their attack methodology, right? They're going to get the first system, and they're going to spread, and they're going to spread, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to get your domain admin credentials. Then they'll eventually get them if you give them enough time, right? Because that's all they do. And that's exactly what an adversary is going to do. So how do they do it? Well, I could run it as a user. So let's say I compromise your box as you. If I can hook one of your processes, I can instantiate another process as you. If you have the privileged access, then I'm already done, right? Or maybe I install a key logger. And when you go to log in to some other system that requires you to type in your username and password, then I, I grab it in the, the key logger files, and then I know what your credentials are, and I can then use it to log in somewhere else, which is, I think, how South Carolina Department of Revenue was compromised, right? They got to the right person's computer, they grabbed the credentials, and then they logged in through Citrix with those credentials, and then went and found the file share, saw the files, and then emailed them off. There are these attacks called pass the hash and pass the ticket. You can search for them online. It's basically a way of getting your, getting your privileges without you entering a password, right? Or I might be able to run something as computer depending on what the privileges are. Server compromise, same ideas, but also services, if you're running services under a username and password, such as a domain username and password, and I didn't say a managed service account, but just a normal user account, maybe I can grab a password that way, right? Or I could do something crazy like modify your service parameters. Uh, do a search for Argenis Fernandez in one of his blog posts. He modifies uh, using the registry what SQL agent runs as and changes it to an executable of his choice. Right? Very easy to do. All I got to do is compromise the OS. Notice I said compromise the OS, right? And if you run in as that service and it identifies in the system as SQL Server agent, guess what? You come in a SQL Server with what kind of probes? Sysadmin rights. Ding, ding, ding. Maintaining access. 
So how do I keep you out? Well, SQL Server, the basic stuff, right? It, I, it, it is a SQL Server conference. I can't go without talking about SQL Server. One, disable anything you don't need, as long as it's reasonable, right? That's called reducing the surface area. Obviously, you want to block access to SQL Server and the system that runs SQL Server as much as possible, which means you want to use firewalls, right? OS, network layer, you want to segment as much as you can. Here's an honest question. How many people need to access SQL Server by any means other than through the connection to SQL Server itself? The answer is very few, right? So why do they have file share access if a file share should show up there? Short answer, they shouldn't. Right? Firewalls can block that. You can lock it down to where if they're not coming from a particularly trusted subnet or something like that, they can't do a, a scan for file shares. They can't do anything like that. Right? That's one way to help on that. You want to isolate the servers as much as possible. If this, is a, if this server has highly privileged information, don't put anything else on it. And lock it down and audit it like nobody's business. But when you start mixing and matching and everything else, and there's a ton of security credentials and everything else, it's very easy to lose something. Very easy for something to get put in unintentionally, which means it's no one's fault, really. It's just the complexity of the environment. Um, don't do the non-standard port thing, right? Because it just makes it harder on users, and it doesn't make it any harder on adversaries. Because I'm going to port scan you. I'm going to find your SQL server or... Maybe I'm not going to port scan you. I just compromised the comptroller's computer. Her Excel spreadsheet said your SQL server is running on 6233. All right, guess what? It doesn't matter if you change it to 6233 because now I know it. It's in the Excel. You're done, right? It doesn't do you any good. Just leave it on the standard ports, make it easier on your end users. Uh, and, 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 and I can't say that enough because you're not gaining anything other than a little bit of time, if that. Uh, remember I mentioned about services running under username passwords? Well, you can use virtual accounts. The, the danger there is that when they leave that box, they leave the box as the computer. So if you have SQL Server virtual account running, if that tries to leave the box, it will leave as the computer's account. Managed service accounts are a lot better in this region. Yes, sir? What about Windows Update and Update? Well, that helps. But how hard is it for me to switch you? I don't have to enter SQL Server to switch you, because where is that setting at? Where is the setting at for Windows versus SQL Server authentication? It's in the registry. So all I've got to do is, comp is change the registry, reboot SQL Server, or wait for SQL Server to reboot. How often does SQL Server reboot? At least once a month, because you have OS patches, right? That's all it takes. Now, now I've got SQL Server logins. And if you didn't put a strong password on the SA account and rename it and disable it like recommendation is, then maybe I get in that way. But in any case, if you're running in an Active Directory environment, you have managed service accounts. And if you're running in an Active Directory environment that is still supported without a six-figure contract with Microsoft, then you have group managed service accounts. So even if you're doing availability groups, you can use those. And that's where the OS keeps in sync with Active Directory to keep the passwords, which also means that the passwords aren't there to be grabbed and can't be laterally used elsewhere. Right. That's one of the reasons why we say to use managed service accounts and group managed service accounts. Do you know if, uh, if you can use that in a more remote group and still have Kerberos? Well, th so the question is, is that with an availability group, how do I have Kerberos and group managed service account? Remember, a group managed service account still is an account in Active Directory. Matter of fact, that's the only way if you're using a group managed service account for those SQL servers to get that because I only have one account then in Active Directory. I can put my SPNs under it. If you have availability groups and you have your SQL servers each running under their own separate managed service accounts or they're running under the virtual SQL server account, they appear as different accounts. You can't have multiple SPNs. You can't have Kerberos authentication. So if you have availability groups, you want to use group managed service accounts. Make sense? Answer your question? All right. Uh, someone mentioned, what about test? So <laughs> what about test? Yes. I love non-production if I'm a red teamer. Why? Because you don't secure it as well if you're most organizations, right? And despite everyone proclaiming, oh, we don't test, 
with production data, all the surveys say otherwise. And we know people lie on the surveys to make themselves look better. So if the surveys say the majority still use production data and non-production, what does that really mean? Well, it really means the numbers are higher than what the survey says because some people are lying to make themselves look better. Your security doesn't tend to be as, as, as good. Your monitoring definitely isn't as good. I mean, I, can t I can't tell you how many times I go into an organization and they have all this licensing for monitoring production. And then I ask about non-prod, and like, oh, why do we worry about that? Oh, well, are you testing production data? Yeah, well, what's that got to do with anything? You know, we don't need it, it's dev. Oh, you forgot, you have production data. If I'm an adversary and I want to data breach you, I do care that you have non-production. As a matter of fact, if I know your monitoring is less, and that's what I'm going to assume, I'm going to go there first. Why go after production if you put, non, if you put production data in non-production? I'm going to go after the environment you have least secured. I really care that somebody's well, you know what? If it's identity theft, no, I absolutely don't. And by the way, identity theft is so prevalent now that it's like pennies on the dollar to, comp to sell a compromised set of identity credentials. It's sad, isn't it? Almost every living, almost every person with social security card number in the United States has had their number compromised. And most of the Canadian numbers are compromised now too, thanks to uh, Capital One. Which by the way, that little picture of Capital One back there, if you go and do Paige Thompson, she basically grabbed the database files and then put them on GitHub. Yeah. Uh, Capital One is only one of the ones. There's others that are suspected to have been breached as well. Remember, with regards to non-production, I don't care about your classification. It's a non-production server. Okay, that means something to you. It's production data. That's what I care about, right? And by the way, since I don't want to get caught, if it's easier to steal the data from non-production, that's what I'm going to do. I don't care, right? I just care about the data. And like you said, unless being a month old means it's not worth anything, I don't care that it's a month old. So even you say, oh, well, we, never, we never use live data, it doesn't matter. If it's, if it's got credit card numbers, if it's got personal identifi identifi identifiable information, if you have intellectual property and it may only be a month old, but you haven't yet patented it, guess what? It's still very valuable to me, isn't it? So how do we solve this problem? Well, one, don't do it. Okay, that's not realistic. Well, can you delete the sensitive or PII data? Some people, some business people will say, no, got to have it. Okay, can you manipulate the data, scrub the data? Yes, okay, do that. If you can't delete it and you can't build a, now, and this is a soapbox thing. When I have someone tell me they can't test unless they have production data, I always ask them if there are outliers that show up from time to time. And what's the answer I always get back? Yes, great. How do I know all those outliers are in the data set right now? Well, they don't happen all that often. Oh. So what about my poor devs that have to build against those outlier data that's not in the data now? So when they go run their tests, their unit tests, their regression tests, everything else, they all pass gloriously. But one month from now, when that outlier shows up, everything blows up and you want to know how they missed it. Well, but... See, I need production data. No, what you really need is a data set that covers all cases, right? So why don't we build that? And what's the number one reason that we get told no? Time. time, okay? Well, how many times do you blow up and how much time when you add all that up is there? And you know what? You still lose the argument. I, I don't have a good answer there because I've argued that multiple times, multiple organizations, and been able to, to, to do all the aggregation of, of, of time and everything else. But the reality is, is that that's the argument. But my point is, is I actually want a set of all cases because then I know that when I run every single test, especially if I'm embracing Agile and DevOps, I can test every case. So if I make a feature change and you have an outlier data that's, that's going to show up, I've tested for it and I'm good, right? It's just common sense. We often don't get that. I understand. Okay, you can't change the data. Can you encrypt it at least, right? Can you encrypt it, make it harder? Now, granted, if I get the right credentials, yeah, I can probably undo your encryption, but here's the thing. Every step that I make that helps move along that process is better. 
And the other thing is if I can't do any of those, you say it's okay in production, fine. I want to apply the same controls. Oh, does that mean you can't do something that you want to do just because it's non-prod? I'm sorry, it's production data. Data classification-wise, it's the same data. It should have the same level of security according to data governance standards. That's the way it is. Maybe now will you uh, consider building that dummy set of data? No, okay, I'll still try. So the question is, is, that, is about segregating versus just taking care of the servers. Remember, I don't care about the servers. I care about the data. And so typically, if you have the data in the SQL servers, you have it elsewhere in the environment as well. right? And that's the big thing. Is also, the thing is, is even if I, if I take care of servers, that's that last point. That's point five, right? which is I'm going to apply the same production level controls. However, production level controls in a development environment goes over how well? And that's the problem. Yep. And, and it's, it's one of those things that this is a fight we, we, we seem to always lose, but really this is the only way you deal with that. All right, so what about exploits? I mentioned that don't, we, don't, we don't focus on those much anymore because they're just not cost effective. I mean, if I'm a criminal, time is money, just like for a business person, right? And the more time I spend getting to your data, the less time I have to go try to get someone else's data and make more money. So it's not our preferred method, but it sometimes happens. Anyone know why I have Starbucks up there? It's not because we're in Seattle and it's everywhere. Huh? No, not Wi-Fi. So this year, it was uncovered that Starbucks had a Dynamics AX instance, and a security researcher was just going through trying to take advantage of the bounty program and was able to access one million transactional records. How did he do it? SQL injection. Right? So maybe launching exploits isn't so bad, but he only came to that after two or three other things that he tried. Now, I know Grant's having a presentation on SQL injection at just this same time, and there's also another security presentation on encryption at this same time. Don't know about the scheduling. That's one of the reasons why, if you haven't already purchased the, um, the videos, it's one of the reasons I'm concerned, because I was like, I got too many things that I want to see. They're all at the same time. But in any case, it was a simple SQL injection. They were able to fix it in two days. And it tells you that someone messed up on a report or something, right? Um, but usually what these exploits are all dependent on is the default configuration, which if you've got a lot of automation and you've tweaked your automation, you won't see the default configuration. Default passwords, hopefully those don't still exist in your environments. I know they do in some environments, but hopefully they're changed. Unpatched vulnerabilities. Okay, so Microsoft's patch cycle hasn't been as... As, it hasn't been as confident inducing as it was, say, four years ago. But still, the, the, the occurrences of bad patches are very, very rare. Um, weak access controls. If, this is a big one that it's kind of one of those things, if you haven't done the right things, then, yeah, I can get through. But typically, I'm going to look for other ways. Because it's like if you do something like put authenticated users and give them read-only access to a sensitive database in SQL Server, yeah, absolutely, I can get the access that way. But how likely is that? How likely is, you going to, uh, is a DBA going to do something like that unless they're an involuntary DBA that's been assigned that role and they're a developer and they just want to get it over with? Uh, bad practices. In industry now, this is less and less because a lot of times we have templates, we have benchmarks, we have all those things that take care of that for us. So that actually brings me right on time for questions because we are at 2.30. So let me open that up. Are there any questions or any comments? Anything? I have a quick question. The last part about your non-production mm -hmm. environment and the team sort of like running through production environment. I mean, would you ever engineer a case where it wasn't? So the question is, is it, would I ever engineer a case where my non-production wasn't as secure as my production? And the answer is yes, if I have developers. Right? Because the reality is, is that in production, our controls are the developers don't have access. Right? You don't, the, the, the recommended best practice in the industry is developers don't have production access to a server. And that's even if you do DevOps, right? Because you use, you rely on automation and other processes to deploy code, right? And so that's a great example of where I don't have it. And if I got to tighten development systems down to production level standards, then your developers have a really hard time doing their job. And that's bad news for your company. And that means you also will get a lot of hate mail. 
right? Other questions? So that, that's one of my recommendations. If you can't completely come off of production data and you can't delete the sensitive data, then the, the next best option is to scrub it. Now, what's the main argument against scrubbing the data? It takes time and what else? Yeah, it's harder for developers to, to, to validate. And also, your business folks will say what? It's not production data. How can I trust it? Anyone hear that one? Yeah, that happens a lot. In which case, it goes back to my argument, my, my soapbox of, well, how do I know that I have all the cases that you might possibly encounter? So that my developers don't have something blow up on them, and we all get yelled at because, you know, it, yeah, I'll, keep, I'll stop right there. Yes, sir? What are some of the best free SQL Server auditing tools? Best free SQL Server auditing tools? Um, unfortunately, I don't know of any. Right, almost all of them, I mean, I'm sure there are out there. The ones I know about are all the third party ones. Redgate has a tool, Idera has a tool, um, Minionware, uh, um, Sean and Jen McCown, they have tools. Um, and most of those are relatively cost inexpensive for what you get. I mean, there are also the, the gold Cadillac IBM type tools as well that are out there. But if you, if you go, I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons why having the vendors here be able to ask them specifically about their products, you can get a look at it, and, and then they'll tell you the pricing, and of course, at the end of a quarter, it's always a lot better. At the end of the year, or their, their fiscal year, it's a whole lot better for getting pricing. But the third-party tools don't tend to be that expensive, especially when you consider how much the data is worth. Uh, the audit scripts that you use, do you care? Oh, yeah. Um, it's posted in a number of places. Uh, most of them are also, so I also write MS SQL tips most of the time when I write, when I have time to. I have a lot of scripts there as well. And, and they're nothing, this, the scripts that I ran aren't anything fancy. You'll find a lot more in-depth scripts that do a lot more detail type stuff. And it's, it's, it's as Kevin said in the previous presentation that he gave, um, you know, the SQL community really puts that stuff out there. We don't hold it close to our chest because the idea is, is that we all want to help support one another. The other thing is, is that the better we're at security, the less likely my stuff gets compromised because most of the time I don't actually have control over the data on me. Any other questions? Yes, sir. All right. So, so his his problem is is that it, it, you know a lot of companies ask the question is it is it better to build or buy, and his company has done a lot of buying. And the problem with that is if you ever get a vendor tool, most of the time they want sysadmin rights or they want DB owner rights. My recommendation for you is to push back immediately, and if you have the time, go ahead and try to figure out what the rights are. I'll give you a great example. So there's a security company, the first time they moved their uh, antivirus product to SQL Server as a back end, they might like the color yellow, not to single anyone out. Um, they required the SA account in order to install in a SQL Server. Now, the gentleman I was working with who was in charge of it, he saw it, he flagged it, he immediately opened a ticket with said yellow company and said, oh, bleep, 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 no, right? And then the guy he opened it with, who was on their security side, I mean, it was, 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 was in a call, you know, support center, who also handled a lot of their secu other security products, basically forwarded it to the development team with similar content, right, with his own comments mirroring that. And so within three weeks, they got fixed. Now, there are some companies that it doesn't matter what you do, and it doesn't matter if you prove that you can do it with tighter permissions, they're not going to budge. So you got basically two options. One, your organization can accept the risk, or two, you can tighten it down and have those scripts to undo it in case you ever have to make a support call and your organization accepts that risk, or three, you junk the product and go with something else. I mean, that's really all that's out there.
So the attack in question, um, it actually, you had to compromise the operating system. And basically, there was one particular SQL Server DLL that it attacked. And specifically, it only attacked SQL Server versions 2012 and 2014. And the reason for that is it basically figured out where the function calls were in memory when that DLL got loaded. And the particular DLL in question, and, and, and there's a write-up I did on MS SQL tips, and it's out there, plenty of places. But basically, it handles the, the login, and it handles the auditing, right? That's what that DLL does as far as what the attackers were focusing on. And so if you have OS-level writes, and if you install malware that now runs basically a system, which is what they do, then you can basically go and map that DLL, figure out where those entry points are, and then tell the operating system, hey, when you get a reference to this memory point, go instead go over here, right? It's a trick of memory. So instead of running through this set of commands, you're actually running through this set. This set is in the malware, right? And this is how they got the golden password. And not only that, it was hooked such that if you use the golden password, did not report the activity to SQL Server. So they could run queries, do everything, and you wouldn't be able to detect them within SQL Server. Now, if they were connected in from, say, a, a remote client, you could see that traffic on the network. Or if you went and did a net stat on the server. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Talk to me afterwards, and I'll, I'll walk you through it. Yeah. But basically, it wasn't the SQL Server was compromised, and applying the CUs wouldn't have done any good, because they actually took that into account. Um, and so they had tr ways to figure out, basically, what memory address to map depending on what version. Any other questions? Uh, any special considerations on system databases? Do attackers much care about those or the same for regular? If I can get to a point where I have access to the system databases, which means I'm usually coming in through a dedicated administrator connection with administrator rights, then I have access to the data in the, in the user databases. And that's really what I care about. No special thing about No, because those are pretty much hardened the way SQL Server has them or as hardened as much as you can reasonably expect. So I'm not going to really go after that as an adversary. There's just not anything that I care about. Anything else? So how about applications that don't support anything you all know radar could be potentially a hard thing? Well, is it that they don't support anything on past? So the question is, is what about applications that support don't support beyond SQL Server 2008 R2? So a couple of things. One, you're running in a SQL Server that's probably not under support unless you went and spent a lot of money with Microsoft, or you stuck it in Azure, which if you haven't, if you're not aware, SQL Server 2008 and 2008R2 are supported for three years past July 9th of this year so that, you know, Microsoft gets you in Azure, right? Windows 2008, 2008R2 expires in January. Guess what? If you move your stuff to Azure, you get three more years of support for free but you're running in Azure, right? So there's that option, but it's still, it, it, it's not the OS, it's not the SQL Server version I'm so concerned about. It's really the stuff around SQL Server, because SQL Server is a tough nut to crack, right? It really is. Uh, unless someone just went out of their way to misconfigure it or didn't know what they were doing and did something crazy, like install Windows with SQL Server authentication, enable the SA account, and put the password as SA. How many of you seen that? Yeah, I mean, there was, a, there was a, a system that we used for badges that it required a login and an essay and a blank password. I kid you not. That was, our, that was our badge system. So I did ask the vendor, since the application and the SQL Server were on the same box, if anything needed to connect to the SQL Server network, I was told no, so guess what I did? I fired off, firewalled off the SQL Server. I mean, we as DBAs had to log onto the box in order to administer SQL Server, but that was the answer, because I couldn't let a SQL Server be on the network that had an essay with a blank password. Anything else? Thank you all for coming. Uh, don't forget for the session. Uh